1996, eight miles off Long Island, a mysterious explosion destroys TWA Flight 800. Very much like JFK's assassination, it'll be a conspiracy forever. After more than a decade, debate still rages over what brought down the plane. Not one person said, I saw a missile going to the plane. Any evidence that doesn't fit their theory they, they bury. In the New Mexico desert, we will conduct a groundbreaking experiment in an attempt to solve the mystery and determine who has the best evidence. <laughs> to many, the story of TWA Flight 800 has become a disturbing mystery, but the facts leading up to that fateful moment are clear. On July 17, 1996, at New York's JFK Airport, 230 people, including a high school French club and a total of 35 TWA employees, many on vacation, boarded the plane bound for Paris. Delays forced Flight 800 to sit on the hot tarmac for two and a half hours, with temperatures hitting 90 degrees. As the sun sank low in the sky, the tower cleared the 747 for takeoff. At 8.31 p.m., as Flight 800 gained altitude, a series of explosions destroyed the plane. The scale of the disaster was enormous. All 230 souls were lost in the tragedy. The wreckage scattered over 10 miles of ocean. But for the grieving families, there would be no quick answers. Donald Nybert lost his daughter in the crash. Cheryl was traveling with a group of 16 other high school students, okay, for a trip to France. Okay, she was a member of the French club, and every year they, they made a trip to France. Our town, Montoursier, was a small community, close-knit. Everyone in the town knew at least one or two of the people that were lost, and so we took a real hard hit. As a father, I need to know, okay, what happened. James Callstrom was the lead FBI investigator for the crash. Almost immediately, he knew this investigation would be unlike any other during his 25-year career. Obviously, you know, one of the toughest days of my life, trying to figure out what happened here. And from the very beginning, one of my dearest friends, wife was the senior stewardess on the plane and i found that out within 20 minutes of the crash he was an agent working in the fbi office in new york city and i'm on the phone with him 20 minutes after this happens and he knows his wife is on that airplane retired national transportation safety board member vernon gross quickly became a media spokesperson trying to explain the crash but gross himself had more questions than answers Well, there are three possibilities. First was that the airplane itself had a mechanical difficulty. The second is it might have had a bomb in the uh, cargo compartment. Or the third, it was hit from the outside by a missile of some sort. Within hours, government investigators mobilized. Well, the players involved really were the FBI. We had NTSB, and of course the US Navy. At peak, I had in excess of 1,000 agents involved in the case. It would become the largest, most expensive airplane disaster investigation to date. And many people suspected foul play. So my first reaction was uh, terrorism. Uh, didn't have any proof, didn't have any evidence, but 747s don't explode in massive fireballs. We were in a very high state of alert in the United States. We were a week away from the Atlanta Olympics. We had numerous threats against us uh, as a country. The first grim task was to recover the wreckage and begin to put the shattered aircraft back together in a hangar on Long Island. As National Transportation Safety Board investigator Robert Francis arrived on the scene, it was clear this would not be a simple investigation. I'm convinced by the hard evidence. We were focused on rebuilding the airplane and, you know, in the traditional NTSB sense, trying to figure out what could have gone wrong that would have caused this kind of explosion. As more than a million pieces of wreckage came together, the lead theory shifted from terrorism to a potential mechanical cause. 
But we ruled out intervention by any device, like a missile or a bomb or a carry-on bomb or anything like that, because we could find no evidence of it. The NTSB reassembled the aircraft, hoping to find the location where the explosion began. The media, however, was fixated on the possibility of a missile strike. I did debate Pierre Salinger uh, early on. He had the idea that there had been a missile fired and hit the aircraft head on. Well, I knew good and well that couldn't be because the cockpit was recovered in integral. I also dismissed missiles because I thought most of them would be heat seekers. If they'd been a heat seeker, they'd hit one of the four engines. Plenty of flame coming out of there. We know that did not happen. We recovered all four engines. You could speculate about a rocket, but, you know, or a missile, just totally baloney. With the arduous task of reassembly finished, investigators felt the physical evidence pointed toward the center fuel tank. Within a couple of months, it was obvious that the explosion took place in the center fuel tank. And there was no disagreement with that between NTSB, the FBI, and, and the scientists we had involved. We knew that's what exploded. What we didn't know is what caused it. After a year of investigation, the FBI and the NTSB revealed their verdict on the Flight 800 crash, November 17, 1997. They believe a spark in the center fuel tank caused the explosion. Although the tank was nearly empty at the time, holding just 50 gallons, the NTSB theorized that the fuel had vaporized during the plane's two and a half hour wait on the hot tarmac. Then, as the plane gained altitude, a single spark ignited the fumes. The high voltage jumped over to the low voltage, went down into the fuel tank, and uh, sparked the explosion that caused this tragedy. What we never could determine is, in this, what we learned to be very, very volatile environment, what was the spark that set it off? To help explain their findings to the public, they asked the CIA to create an animation illustrating their theory of the disaster. They claim that the force of the center tank explosion blew the cockpit off the plane and triggered a series of explosions that destroyed Flight 800. As the investigation unfolds, there are many objections to the government's explanation of events. One of the skeptics is retired TWA pilot Mike Potter. There's no evidence of a spark in the center field tank. They can't point their finger to a wire and say, hey, this one's burned or this wire shows high energy going into the tank. They can't support that. There is no proof. But if a spark was present, would it cause an explosion inside a similar tank under identical conditions? Using a salvage center fuel tank, we will conduct an exclusive and elaborate experiment that will test the government's spark theory. Will it expose the mystery behind TWA Flight 800's tragedy? Next on Best Evidence. After a year of investigation into the tragic explosion of TWA Flight 800, the official report seems clear. Good afternoon, everyone. The conclusion, a single spark within an empty center fuel tank destroyed the 747 just after takeoff. But more than 10 years later, many still doubt the government's explanation. Over 150 eyewitness reports challenge the official conclusion of the crash. Paul Angelides, a man who makes his living observing critical details as a structural engineer, witnessed the final seconds of Flight 800. After dinner, my wife took our son and put him in his bath and get him ready for bed, and I walked out onto the deck to look at the ocean. I'm very confident in what I saw. As I opened the door to the deck, I saw at a very high elevation in the sky and very what appeared to be high up and close to the beach, a red phosphorescent object. And that object started to go out towards the horizon. And as that object got closer to the horizon and I was following it, I could see the aircraft lights. And that aircraft was traveling from the west towards the east, almost perpendicular to the path that this object was taking. And I could see the lights going blink, 
blink, blink. And these objects converged. And when they converged, that's when there was an explosion, a huge fireball. And the fireball dropped into the sea very rapidly, like a rock. Paul Angelides wasn't the only person who noticed things in the sky on that warm summer night. More than 150 eyewitnesses reported seeing an object move from the surface of the ocean up to where the airplane was flying. Many people, including Flight 800 independent investigator, Dr. Tom Stalkup, believe the object traveling from the water must have been a missile. My organization, as well as myself, believe that there is overwhelming evidence that a missile caused the crash. Well, this crash happened off Long Island, you know, off the Hamptons. The unfortunate thing for crash investigators is a heck of a lot of airports around there. You know, you got JFK, you got Newark, uh, you got Islip. You know, you got a lot of radar sites, and the radar sites, what they can do is, you know, track aircraft, so they can also track, unfortunately, a crashing aircraft. All right, what we have here is basically a satellite's viewpoint of the crash. You know, you're looking down at it. All these blue dots represent radar returns. So basically, it's kind of a, a dotted line of where the aircraft went when it crashed. The red lines are the plane flying along with this electricity still operating. Where the red lines stop is where the initial explosion occurred. So you can see the plane was traveling in this direction. It's heading to Paris. But what I want to direct your attention to is right here. This is the initial explosion. Now, these uh, pieces of wreckage that you know landed in this area exited the aircraft at apparent supersonic speeds. Now, now what could have caused that? Not a center wing tank explosion. Basically, uh, a fuel tank explosion is a low velocity explosion. It just doesn't have the uh, energy or the velocity to launch things out the aircraft. Significant pieces of wreckage, supersonic, or basically a quarter mile or half mile like the radar data shows. You need something much bigger, much bigger and more uh, high velocity explosion, such as a bomb or a missile. Michael Potter was a TWA pilot for 20 years. He's taken a great interest in the investigation, but ultimately, he rejects the government's explanation of the crash. TWA's breakup was caused by an external event. I think it was a missile that was fired from the water, went up. Whoever fired the missile all of a sudden decided that they lost control of it and detonated it. Sadly to say, it was too close to TWA to where the uh, collateral damage was a huge pressure wave that just punched a hole in the airplane and brought it down. In July of 1997, a year after the crash, Vernon Gross attends a special briefing where, for the first time, he is presented with specific evidence and the testimony of witnesses. At the meeting as well was a helicopter pilot who had flown in Vietnam and knew very well how to identify explosive ordnance. And he had seen, with his co-pilot, ordnance going up from the surface. And then when I learned that there were 153 eyewitnesses on a 270-degree arc on the water, on land, and in the air, and yet both the FBI and the CIA tried to convince everybody that 153 people were seeing things upside down. They were seeing uh, ordnance coming down rather than going up. Uh, I began to be somewhat suspicious. Gross had publicly argued against a missile strike in the early stages of the investigation. The evidence didn't seem to support a direct missile hit, but there was another possible explanation. The thing is, the center wing tank did explode. There's just no question about it, but I do not believe necessarily it was the initiating incident. Is the government guilty of suppressing evidence and trying to mislead the public? One retired United States Air Force Brigadier General, Benton Parton, followed the news and investigation and also believes there was an alternative explanation to the spark theory. My opinion is it was brought down by a surface-to-air missile. Brigadier General Parton spent much of his career designing and testing weapons for the military. This shows a picture of a continuous rod warhead from all the analysis and all the reports and everything I've, saw, I've seen, and looking at the photographic evidence, it appears to me that that continuous rod warhead went off under the airplane. General Parton helped design the continuous rod warhead missile. When activated, it explodes with a huge blast radius and could effectively destroy an airplane without having to make a direct hit. It cut right through that airplane, and it went down and it cut through this right right fuel tank. When that front nose was separated, the back just rotated down around the lateral axis. 
those pictures show that there was a, an actual reduction in, in strength there tremendously for it to separate clean because there's no fire damage at all to the front section of that airplane that came down. I sent to Kallstrom a fax. I told him it had to have been a missile. I never received a response back. As compelling as it sounds, Brigadier General Parton's theory is difficult to prove without corroborating evidence. If the 747's reassembled structure doesn't provide direct answers, perhaps clues found among the victims of the crash will offer new insight. Dr. Charles Wetley was the medical examiner and director of forensic sciences for Suffolk County in York. He examined the 230 bodies of the victims, searching for the evidence that would help explain the cause of the explosion. Obviously, they wanted to close the books with the center fuel tank theory. Uh, obviously, it didn't close the books. In my opinion, the cause of the crash has not been fully elucidated. I still think there are a lot of questions that remain. If it was a missile, for example, there's no direct hit. If it was a center fuel tank explosion, it did not go upward into the passenger compartment of the plane to cause any particular cluster of injuries that you might expect to find. We, of course, kept the biological evidence for uh, analysis ourselves, but as far as physical evidence was concerned, uh, the shrapnel and things like that that were foreign art of foreign bodies that we removed from the uh, victims, these are turned over to the FBI for their own analysis. I never received an official report, say, from the NTSB or from the FBI on their analysis and so forth. Why haven't uh, analytical data been made available to the public if this is not a terrorist act? The alternative theory that a surface-fired missile exploded very near the 747 and initiated a chain reaction, destroying the plane, was gaining many proponents. But if this was the case, could the government actually coordinate a successful cover-up? I thought that the FBI was withholding some information in their investigation, which would be a normal process. And I thought that at the time, they would release it. And I'm surprised that it's been 10 years and nothing has been released. Everything was considered except the possibility of friendly fire. That's just preposterous. The notion that we could keep thousands of people silent on a conspiracy of this magnitude you know, with, with 230 dead people, with little children, the evidence would be obvious. Both sides present different theories for what destroyed Flight 800. But has key evidence in the case been overlooked? Next on Best Evidence. The FBI and NTSB claim that a spark inside the center fuel tank ignited fuel vapors, turning TWA Flight 800 into a fireball in 1996. But many feel that evidence pointing to a missile strike is being suppressed. Even the animation that the FBI and NTSB created to help explain the chain of events is called into question. I felt like I was watching this big government commercial being shot. time in all the major networks live in an FBI press conference he had a lot of eyewitnesses that saw the same thing and the government needed some way to explain them and not only to explain them but to convince the American public with the FBI and NTSB leading the investigation the fact that the secretive CIA created the animation only added suspicion in many people's minds I thought it was necessary my team thought it was necessary particularly for the families to try to, in a pictorial way, explain what the eyewitnesses saw, or the majority of the eyewitnesses saw. The government animation depicts the center tank exploding, launching the cockpit section forward from the aircraft. The shattered 747 then began a rapid climb in altitude, gaining thousands of feet before rolling over and falling towards the ocean. And they said, okay, this may have looked like a missile attacking an aircraft. What also got me was their statement saying that no witness saw the aircraft in the streak separately. That's plain false. The CIA effectively lied to the American public on November 18th, 1997. In retrospect, I shouldn't have asked the CIA, but they had the, they had the laboratory, they had the technicians that could do it. It was basically, I was just tasking out an order to them. They had nothing to do with the investigation, other than we asked them to look worldwide for any intelligence they might have at the beginning 
The FBI identified and carried out interviews with hundreds of crash witnesses, but their statements were not included in the final accident report. Many critics feel that the animation has become a tool to discount their testimony. We had about 200, 250 eyewitnesses, and not one person said, I saw a missile going to the plane. Nobody said that, but they said they saw things shooting up into the sky. And things actually did shoot up in the sky when that plane exploded. The vast majority of the eyewitnesses, well over 50%, they looked up a minute after the explosion took place. It took that long for the sound to travel into the shore of Long Island. So when they looked up, that catastrophe happened a minute earlier. First thing I noticed was that red phosphorescent object high in the sky. No sounds. No sounds until the fireball was all over. I saw what I saw, then I heard the sounds. When Paul Angelides saw the government account of the crash, he tried a second time to explain what he had seen to the FBI. My observations were inconsistent with this aircraft exploding from an internal source. So I called the FBI. I got through to a, a man who answered the phone, and he said, um, so you want to change your story? And I said, no, I just thought that, you know, I've been watching this, and I think you guys are way off base, and maybe you ought to send an expert out to talk to me. And I never heard from anybody ever again. But is there evidence to corroborate the eyewitness testimony? I think it'd be good to know why the NTSB continues to say that the plane climbed when clearly the radar data says it did not climb it and it went down. Where are the facts that back up that scenario? Because every report released to date shows it conflicts with the radar data. And obviously the radar was what helped us find the wreckage initially. Once we had that, radar data didn't make much difference. The key was getting 98% of the aircraft recovered. I'm convinced by the hard evidence. But skeptics latched on to further evidence suggesting a missile strike. Not from terrorism, but friendly fire. There is proof that the U.S. Navy was using the waters around Long Island for training exercises the night of the crash. The Navy reports that we got you know, under the Freedom of Information Act aren't very descriptive, but they know that they were conducting some type of uh, military exercises in the area. Well, there's always military ships at sea. They're coming and going, but we wanted to account for all of it, and we did. Some of those things were classified in nature, but there was no military asset in the area that had the capability of shooting down an airplane. Dr. Tom Stalkup believes that the initial piece of debris blown off of Flight 800 could prove a friendly fire missile strike, but the evidence was never turned over to the NTSB. The FBI had a policy of withholding suspicious-looking evidence from the safety board or at least the, uh, the hangar where the reconstruction was being conducted. And they had a separate room where this wreckage went. That's just basically nonsensical, that the FBI was removing things. That's what the FBI does. They inspect things, and they send things to the laboratory. FBI agents collect the things that field investigators wanted further analysis done on. Some things were brought to Washington for further evaluation. You know, the notion that we were nefarious or you know, covertly doing things. I mean, that's that's what we do in investigations. You know, we, we, we seek the truth. Where's the evidence? Where did it go? What were the results of those analyses? You know, the, there's no report from the FBI showing the, the results. You know, the safety board doesn't even talk about them. With the wreckage itself in question, something else was uncovered. Between rows 15 and 25, the uh, government found and detected explosives in the wreckage, traces of explosives, uh, PETN and RDX were found inside the aircraft. Now that is something that is used in missile warheads and also bombs. That evidence was made public. It was in the New York Times, a big story. And at some point in time in the investigation, we found traces of explosives in the airplane, PETN and RDX, which are components of plastic explosive. Minute traces, but it made no sense made no sense to me, it made no sense to the investigators, because we had all the floor tiles, we had the seats, we had all the pieces of the airplane, nothing was blown up. Then, the FBI released their explanation for the plastic explosive residue. They claim that security teams conducted an exercise with bomb-sniffing dogs on the 747 that would become Flight 800. And some of the explosive residue was left behind on the aircraft. Upon further investigation, that story has been completely discredited. We have the gate logs 
uh, from the plane and it tells when it left its gate. And we also have the testimony of the officer that conducted the exercise. And the plane that he was allegedly doing his bomb training exercise on was you know, being loaded with 400 passengers at the time on the way to you know, Honolulu, Hawaii. Yes, we found traces of explosives, but I mean, it didn't prove anything. It just added to great speculation and you know, the conspiracy theorists loved it because it fit into their, their notion that everything's a conspiracy. With each side disputing the other's claims, the debate returns to the central question. The government's case is centered on a spark somehow igniting the jet fumes in the center fuel tank. But is this really possible? They can say, yeah, there's an imaginary spark set this thing off, but they can't say where the spark came from because there isn't any proof. NTSB came to the conclusion that, that uh, wiring, low voltage wiring, high voltage wiring in the airplane, that the covering of those wires uh, through the many, many years of service of that airplane uh, rubbed off. What I've seen over the years where I dismantle an older airplane, they have a plastic coating and then they have a, a, another coating and then they have a um, like a shield. And then, then you go through another coating and then you get to the wire itself. But that wire itself, it's a good airworthy wire. There's nothing wrong with it. They have to stick with their story. I think it's beyond reasonable doubt uh, where the explosion took place. It was looked at by literally hundreds of experts from multiple agencies. We had outside experts. I mean, we looked at every piece of this airplane multiple times. And when we were done with that, we hired an outside expert who was the chief metallurgist for Alcoa just to go over it again because we didn't want to trust the eyeballs of one forensic team. In the hope of settling the debate, best evidence has transported a center fuel tank to an explosive test center in New Mexico. Here, our experts will try to replicate the government's spark theory. The preparation is intensive, as the crew labors to duplicate the conditions aboard Flight 800 as closely as possible. What will happen when the technician flips the switch and a spark appears in the tank? Next, on Best Evidence. Just moments after lifting off, a 747 carrying 230 people explodes and plummets into the ocean near Long Island, New York. What happened to TWA Flight 800? And these objects converged. We ruled out intervention by any device like a missile or a bomb. There's no evidence of a spark in the center field tank. My opinion is that it was brought down by a surface air missile. We know what happened, but we don't know exactly how it happened. Years after the NTSB and FBI released their official verdict, many questions still remain unanswered about the fate of Flight 800. To test the heart of the debate, whether the government's claim that a spark in a mostly empty fuel tank could have triggered the disaster, best evidence has brought a similar fuel tank to the New Mexico desert. Here, members of an internationally recognized division of New Mexico Tech, the Energetic Materials Research and Testing Center, or EMRTC, are conducting an experiment designed to duplicate the conditions within TWA Flight 800's center fuel tank. Our test today is to test the sensitivity of a, a jet fuel air mixture to detonation in a fuel tank. I'm a senior research engineer here at uh, EMRTC. And my job is to uh, construct experiments and do studies of explosives. And the tank we have here is the center fuel tank from a 737 aircraft, and it's approximately one-fourth the size of the one that was involved in the Flight 800 mishap. What we're doing is we're placing a small amount of fuel in the bottom of the tank, and then we're heating it to the temperature that is believed to have existed, which is about 112 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we'll be introducing a spark of various energies, starting at a small fraction of a joule and working up until we get some kind of uh, ignition. We're expecting ignition if uh, the temperature and uh, other conditions are present. If you can demonstrate, for example, that a, uh, an empty or near empty center fuel tank in the presence of a static electrical charge, in fact, does cause explosions, I think that would be very convincing evidence. On the other hand, if you find out that it's almost impossible to do, then I think we have to look at another hypothesis. 
I think that if you cannot reproduce the cause of the crash, then I think everybody's mind should change. Well, I think it could be useful. I wouldn't argue against that. However, <clears throat> I'm a physicist and, and worked in the applied physics lab at Boeing for years. And the key to an experiment like that is, is its uh, veracity. You've got to design your experiment so it has the maximum amount of realism. The crew slowly heats the test tank so the fuel will vaporize just as it did on the hot tarmac back in 1996. This is the probe we're going to put inside of the fuel tank and we enter through a bulkhead and that's what this uh, sheet of plastic is here for is to provide a, a flange for mounting it on the bulkhead. And on this probe we have a, a small stirring fan to make sure that the fuel air mixture inside the tank is homogeneous, at least near the experiment site. We'll start first with small amounts of energy. It'll be a fairly weak spark. And as time goes on and if we don't get any action, we will increase the strength of the spark until we do get a reaction. We also have a small camera that will be installed in here to watch this. One of the things we're trying to do is get the tank to 112 degrees Fahrenheit. And so we'll have a temperature sensor lashed onto our probe here so it'll be nearby where the spark is occurring and we'll also have a temperature sensor on the floor of the tank inside to show what the floor temperature of the tank will be. Jerome and the EMRTC engineers have gone to great lengths to control the variables in the experiment and ensure the outcome is as accurate as possible. After 10 days of planning and construction, the parameters have been set and the sensors are in place. The moment of truth is approaching. And we've been heating this now for about three hours, and we're finally approaching the temperature that we need for testing. With the conditions set to mimic that hot summer day in 1996, Jerome is ready to begin initiating the sparks. Okay, we're presently charging to start introducing the spark discharges. NTSB research suggests that a spark between 5 and 100 millijoules of energy would be enough to ignite the fumes in the tank. This is a four millijoules spark coming. And that apparently wasn't enough to not produce action. Next is the eight millijoules. Okay, ready, sparking. That spark, it did not produce anything. Next is uh, 32 millijoules. Ready for spark. Sparking. No action. Next will be 50 millijoules. We're measuring the voltage that's actually on the capacitor, which will be slightly less than the meter reading here on the console. Ready? 50 millijoules did not do it. Going to 75, ready? five millijoules, the amount of energy that triggered our explosion, is about the same size of spark as you would generate by walking across a carpet and touching a metal object. There she goes, folks. We uh, finally had a very aggressive ignition at 75 millijoules, and a lot of pieces were lofted and went maybe 100 feet. So it was, it was quite a test. With the experiment complete, all that remains now is to analyze the new evidence and gauge its impact on the case of TWA Flight 800. Will this analysis change minds? Find out on Best Evidence. Based on the mysterious event that destroyed TWA Flight 800 in 1996, Best Evidence came here to New Mexico to conduct a fuel tank experiment. After vaporizing jet fuel within a recovered tank, we began introducing sparks Starting with just four millijoules, we worked our way up to 75, which finally ignited the tank. The strength of the explosion surprised our EMRTC technicians. Well, there's no doubt about it. Uh, an explosion of this magnitude in an aircraft in flight would be uh, absolutely disastrous and instantaneously uh, destroy the aircraft. But the big value of this experiment is that it showed at a practical scale instead of the laboratory scale, what these phenomena are, and what we saw did agree well with the prediction that it would blow up. So in that sense, we now have another data point for a much larger target, a much larger system than the investigators have been able to consider so far. 75 millijoules of energy creates the same size spark as you would receive if you touched a doorknob after walking across a carpeted floor. 
But is it possible that a spark of this size could occur inside the 747 fuel tank? The spark we used to set this off was not a sensational amount of energy. It was fairly energetic in terms of, of what you would ordinarily see in, in small static discharges from pieces rubbing together or some, something of that nature. The one thing we learned from this is that if you do have a system that is in the mid-range of the fuel-to-air ratios and the temperature and in this combustibility range, that we can set it off with a relatively small amount of energy. Were those conditions the same in the tank when it was at, you know, 13,000 feet? You know, those are, those are variables. It's just like every scientific experiment. There's a lot of unknowns. 12 and a half at 1,000, ready? Well, the more energy you need, the less likely it happened. Our new evidence suggests that a fuel tank explosion can take place under similar conditions. But questions remain about how the force of the explosion would have affected Flight 800. If you had an optimum fuel-air mix, I don't think you would get the uh, tremendous force of separation of the fuselage to rip out those seats the way you did. That took a lot of actual G's to do that. It was a perfect setup, you know, to blow the tank. And it proved that the tank would blow up. But it also proved that um, it wasn't such a catastrophic explosion that it blew the thing in every direction. What you've done is uh, you've really, in a way, uh, disprove what the NTSB said, because in your experiment, you, you show the top half of, the, of a tank going ballistic. Going up, you know, into the air, and then the rest of it staying intact. The NTSB is, is saying that the thing blew up and it blew forward, and that none of that happened. Had the tank blown and done that, then you'd have a great big bubble in the, in the cabin, you know, with all this, the floorboards going up like this. And from what I have seen and determined, that didn't, didn't happen. Best evidence asked retired NTSB official Vernon Gross to review our experiment and share his conclusions. The problem for this particular experiment is that it can't be totally realistic. And, and no experiment is, so this is not faulting the, the test itself. If there was a spark in the center wing tank, what in the world was the ignition source? Uh, we don't know that. I'm convinced that it's not a, a 747 problem. The, the impressive evidence is millions and hundreds of millions of flight hours without ever having another airplane do this. And of course, the tank blew and uh, the airplane disintegrated, but uh, I think it was initiated by external force. The question of the initiating event lingers. Could a spark have been created within the center fuel tank? Or is it possible that a missile detonating near Flight 800 caused the chain reaction of explosions that ultimately destroyed the plane? We will investigate how air travel has changed as a result of this tragedy when best evidence returns. While flying just above 13,000 feet on July 17, 1996, an explosion blew apart TWA Flight 800. The official government version of events is that a spark within the center fuel tank ignited a small amount of jet fuel vapors and caused the crash. Have the results gained from our best evidence experiment helped illuminate the crash? I did not expect it to throw pieces in the air to the extent it did, and it uh, just generally went much quicker than I had expected it to. It was really a lesson in how little energy it takes to set off a fuel-air explosion because this was not a, a real dramatic source of ignition. Despite the fact that the experiment proves that the government's theory of a single spark destroying the plane is possible, those that doubt the official explanation feel the nature of a fuel tank explosion doesn't match the damage of the recovered wreckage. There's also the lack of any new safety procedures. If they thought it was a mechanical, why hasn't the FAA done anything about it with other uh, 747s? They could have even changed the procedure and, and, for example, and not allowed them to fly with low fuel. Or they could tell them to load only cold fuel on a hot day. It has taken more than 10 years, but new safety measures are finally being considered. Airlines may add inert, non-explosive gases to empty fuel tanks, 
in an effort to protect airplanes from these kinds of disasters in the future. I think the inerting, the focus on the environment and not just the source of ignition, it's changed the way newer airplanes are going to be manufactured and certificated. It had an enormous impact. I would say 80% a function of TWA, maybe even more than that. Although this disaster has influenced airline safety, there continues to be doubt about the true cause of the crash. I think this accident's going to be very much like JFK's assassination. It'll be a conspiracy forever, and you'll have advocates on both sides and uh, insufficient evidence, frankly, to make it absolutely conclusive. I had the reports, the NTSB reports, for the pictures that I have in the hangar shows a tremendous amount of information to me that corroborates what happened. You know, the spark in, a, in an empty gas tank is, uh, you know, it's just something that just doesn't really happen. The collision was witnessed, you know, and the radar data, you know, it confirms it. So uh, there's very little doubt in my mind what happened. And most people I show the evidence to quickly agree because it's overwhelming. It's an unsolved mystery. Uh, all the pieces are there to um, prove what happened. Uh, it's just that uh, powers to be at the top of the NTSB and the FBI and the CIA uh, didn't want it to become um, general knowledge of why the airplane went down. If they reopened the case and, and looked at the loose ends, they would come up with a different probable cause. I think the right theory, minus any evidence to the contrary, was that the high voltage jumped over to the low voltage and went down into the fuel tank and blew up this highly volatile mixture that had vaporized while it sat there on tarmac. The only explanation that fits the evidence is a missing. Something came off the ocean with a smoke trail that glowed like, the, uh, like a missile and exploded like a missile and a plane came down. You know, the thing that uh, Bill Clinton ordered me to keep my mouth shut and the Navy shot the plane down, or, you know, we knew it was an act of terrorism, but for foreign policy reasons, we didn't want to say so. And that's all preposterous. I mean, it's absolutely preposterous. It was obviously a very tragic event for the people on that aircraft. Even though I was 10 miles away, I could clearly see events unfolding in the sky. To me, certainly there's a lot of unanswered questions as to why my observations don't match what the official explanation of what happened. I still have to accept what I saw. people suspected foul play. So my first reaction was uh, terrorism. Uh, didn't have any proof, didn't have any evidence, but 747s don't explode in massive fireballs. We were in a very high state of alert in the United States. We were a week away from the Atlanta Olympics. We had numerous threats against us uh, as a country. The first grim task was to recover the wreckage and begin to put the shattered aircraft back together in a hangar on Long Island. As National Transportation Safety Board investigator Robert Francis arrived on the scene, it was clear this would not be a simple investigation. I'm convinced by the hard evidence. We were focused on rebuilding the airplane and, you know, in the traditional NTSB sense, trying to figure out what could have gone wrong that would have caused this kind of explosion. As more than a million pieces of wreckage came together, the lead theory shifted from terrorism to a potential mechanical cause. So we ruled out intervention by any device, like a missile or a bomb or a carry-on bomb or anything like that, because we could find no evidence of it. The NTSB reassembled the aircraft, hoping to find the location where the explosion began. The media, however, was fixated on the possibility of a missile. Faster, which will be slightly less than the meter reading here on the console. Ready? 50 millijoules did not do it. Going to 75, ready?
75 millijoules, the amount of energy that triggered our explosion, is about the same size of spark as you would generate by walking across a carpet and touching a metal object. There she goes, folks. We uh, finally had a very aggressive ignition at 75 millijoules, and a lot of pieces were lofted and went maybe 100 feet. So it was, it was quite a test. With the experiment complete, all that remains now is to analyze the new evidence and gauge its impact on the case of TWA Flight 800. Will this analysis change minds? Find out on Best Evidence. Based on the mysterious event that destroyed TWA Flight 800 in 1996, Best Evidence came here to New Mexico to conduct a fuel tank experiment. After vaporizing jet fuel within a recovered tank, we began introducing sparks. Starting with just four millijoules, we worked our way up to 75, which finally ignited the tank. It has the maximum amount of realism. The crew slowly heats the test tank, so the fuel will vaporize just as it did on the hot tarmac back in 1996. This is the probe we're going to put inside of the fuel tank, and we enter through a bulkhead, and that's what this sheet of plastic is here for, is to provide a, a flange for mounting it on the bulkhead. And on this probe, we have a, a small stirring fan to make sure that the fuel-air mixture inside the tank is homogeneous, at least near the experiment site. We'll start first with small amounts of energy. It'll be a fairly weak spark, and as time goes on, and if we don't get any action, we will increase the strength of the spark until we do get a reaction. We also have a small camera that'll be installed in here to watch this. One of the things we're trying to do is get the tank to 112 degrees Fahrenheit. And so we'll have a temperature sensor lashed onto our probe here so it'll be nearby where the spark is occurring. And we'll also have a temperature sensor on the floor of the tank inside to show what the floor temperature of the tank will be. Jerome and the EMRTC engineers have gone to great lengths to control the variables in the experiment and ensure the outcome is as accurate as possible. After 10 days of planning and construction, the parameters have been set and the sensors are in place. The moment of truth is approaching. And we've been heating this now for about three hours and we're finally approaching the temperature that we need for testing. With the conditions set to mimic that hot summer day on a spark, somehow igniting the jet fumes in the center fuel tank. But is this really possible? They can say, yeah, there's an imaginary spark set this thing off, but they can't say where the spark came from because there isn't any proof. NTSB came to the conclusion that, that uh, wiring, low voltage wiring, high voltage wiring in the airplane that the covering of those wires uh, through the many, many years of service of that airplane uh, rubbed off. What I've seen over the years where I dismantle an older airplane, they have a plastic coating and then they have a, a, another coating and then they have a um, like a shield and then, then you go through another coating and then you get to the wire itself. But that wire itself is a good airworthy wire. There's nothing wrong with it. They have to stick with their story. I think it's beyond reasonable doubt uh, where the explosion took place. It was looked at by literally hundreds of experts from multiple agencies. We had outside experts. I mean, we looked at every piece of this airplane multiple times. And when we were done with that, we hired an outside expert who was the chief metallurgist for Alcoa just to go over it again because we didn't want to trust the eyeballs of one forensic team. In the hope of settling the debate, Best Evidence has transported a center fuel tank to an explosive test center in New Mexico. His theory is difficult to prove without corroborating evidence. If the 747's reassembled structure doesn't provide direct answers, perhaps clues found among the victims of the crash will offer new insight. Dr. Charles Wetley was the medical examiner and director of forensic sciences for Suffolk County in York. He examined the 230 bodies of the victims, searching for the evidence that would help explain the cause of the explosion. Obviously, they wanted to close the books with the center fuel tank theory. Uh, obviously, it didn't close the books. In my opinion, the cause of the crash has not been fully elucidated. I still think there are a lot of questions that remain. If it was a missile, for example, there's no direct hit. If it was a center fuel tank explosion, it did not go upward into the passenger compartment. 
of the plane to cause any particular cluster of injuries that you might expect to find. We, of course, kept the biological evidence for uh, analysis ourselves, but as far as physical evidence was concerned, uh, the shrapnel and things like that that were in foreign, art foreign bodies that we removed from the uh, victims, these are turned over to the FBI for their own analysis. I never received an official report, say, from the NTSB or from the FBI on their analysis and so forth. Why haven't uh, analytical data been made available to the public if this is not a terrorist act? The alternative theory that a surface-fired missile exploded very near the 747 and initiated a chain reaction, destroying the plane, was gaining many proponents. But if supersonic speeds, now, now what could have caused that not a center wing tank explosion? Basically, uh, a fuel tank explosion is a low velocity explosion. It just doesn't have the uh, energy or the velocity to launch things out the aircraft. Significant pieces of wreckage, supersonic, or basically a quarter mile or half mile like the radar data shows. You need something much bigger, much bigger and more uh, high velocity explosion, such as a bomb or a missile. Michael Potter was a TWA pilot for 20 years. He's taken a great interest in the investigation, but ultimately, he rejects the government's explanation of the crash. TWA's breakup was caused by an external event. I think it was a missile that was fired from the water, went up. Whoever fired the missile all of a sudden decided that they lost control of it and detonated it. Sadly to say, it was too close to TWA to where the uh, collateral damage was a huge pressure wave that just punched a hole in the airplane and brought it down. In July of 1997, a year after the crash, Vernon Gross attends a special briefing where, for the first time, he is presented with specific evidence and the testimony of witnesses. At the meeting as well was a helicopter pilot who had flown in Vietnam and knew very well how to identify explosive ordnance, and he had seen, with his co-pilot, ordnance going up from the surface. And then when I learned that there were 153 eyewitnesses on a... Once we had that radar data, it didn't make much difference. The key was getting 98% of the aircraft recovered. I'm convinced by the hard evidence. But skeptics latched on to further evidence suggesting a missile strike. Not from terrorism, but friendly fire. There is proof that the U.S. Navy was using the waters around Long Island for training exercises the night of the crash. reports that we got you know, under the Freedom of Information Act aren't very descriptive, but they know that they were conducting some type of uh, military exercises in the area. Well, there's always military ships at sea. They're coming and going, but we wanted to count for all of it, and we did. Some of those things were classified in nature, but there was no military asset in the area that had the capability of shooting down an airplane. Dr. Tom Stalkup believes that the initial piece of debris blown off of Flight 800 could prove a friendly fire missile strike but the evidence was never turned over to the NTSB. The FBI had a policy of withholding suspicious looking evidence from the safety board, or at least the, uh, the hangar where the reconstruction was being conducted. And they had a separate room where this wreckage went. That's just basically nonsensical, that the FBI was removing things. That's what the FBI does. They inspect things and they send things to the laboratory. FBI agents collect the things that field investigators wanted further analysis done on. Some things were brought to Washington for further evaluation. You know, the notion that we were pieces of wreckage that, you know, landed in this area, exited the aircraft at apparent supersonic speeds. Now, now what could have caused that not a center wing tank explosion? Basically, uh, a fuel tank explosion is a low velocity explosion. It just doesn't have the uh, energy or the velocity to launch things out the aircraft significant pieces of wreckage, supersonic, or basically a quarter mile or half mile like the radar data shows. You need something much bigger, much bigger and more uh, high velocity explosion, such as a bomb or a missile. Michael Potter was a TWA pilot for 20 years. He's taken a great interest in the investigation, but ultimately, he rejects the government's explanation of the crash. TWA's breakup was caused by an external event. I think it was a missile that was fired from the water, went up. Whoever fired the missile all of a sudden decided that they lost control of it and detonated it. Sadly to say, it was too close to TWA to where the uh, collateral damage was a huge pressure wave that just punched a hole in the airplane and brought it down. In July of 1997, a year after the crash, Vernon Gross attends a special briefing where, for the first time, he is presented with specific evidence and the testimony of witnesses. 
At the meeting as well was a helicopter pilot who had flown in Vietnam and knew very well how to identify explosive ordnance. And he had seen with his co-pilot ordnance going up from the surface. Well, that couldn't be because the cockpit was recovered in integral. I also dismissed missiles because I thought most of them would be heat seekers. If they'd been a heat seeker, they'd hit one of the four engines. Plenty of flame coming out of there. We know that did not happen. We recovered all four engines. You could speculate about a rocket, but you know, or a missile, just totally blown. With the arduous task of reassembly finished, investigators felt the physical evidence pointed toward the center fuel tank. Within a couple of months, it was obvious that the explosion took place in the center fuel tank. And there was no disagreement with that between NTSB, the FBI, and, and the scientists we had involved. We knew that's what exploded. What we didn't know is what caused it. After a year of investigation, the FBI and the NTSB revealed their verdict on the Flight 800 crash, November 17, 1997. They believe a spark in the center fuel tank caused the explosion. Although the tank was nearly empty at the time, holding just 50 gallons, the NTSB theorized that the fuel had vaporized during the plane's two and a half hour wait on the hot tarmac. Then, as the plane gained altitude, a single spark ignited the fumes. The high voltage jumped over to the low voltage, went down into the fuel tank. You know, the, there's no report from the FBI showing the, the results. You know, the safety board doesn't even talk about them. With the wreckage itself in question, something else was uncovered. Between rows 15 and 25, the uh, government found and detected explosives in the wreckage, traces of explosives, uh, PETN and RDX were found inside the aircraft. Now that is something that is used in missile warheads and also bombs. That evidence was made public. It was in the New York Times, a big story. And at some point in time in the investigation, we found traces of explosives in the airplane, PETN and RDX, which are components of plastic explosive. Minute traces, but it made no sense. It made no sense to me, it made no sense to the investigators, because we had all the floor tiles, we had the seats, we had all the pieces of the airplane, nothing was blown up. Then, the FBI released their explanation for the plastic explosive residue. They claim that security teams conducted an exercise with bomb-sniffing dogs on the 747 that would become Flight 800. And some of the explosive residue was left behind on the aircraft. Upon further investigation, that story has been completely discredited. We have the gate logs uh, from the plane and it tells when it left its gate. And we also have the testimony of the officer that conducted the exercise. And the plane that he was allegedly doing his bomb training exercise on was you know, being loaded with 400. TWA Flight 800. The official report seems clear. Good afternoon, everyone. The conclusion. A single spark within an empty center fuel tank destroyed the 747 just after takeoff. But more than 10 years later, many still doubt the government's explanation. Over 150 eyewitness reports challenged the official conclusion of the crash. Paul Angelides, a man who makes his living observing critical details as a structural engineer, witnessed the final seconds of Flight 800. After dinner, my wife took our son and put him in his bath and get him ready for bed, and I walked out onto the deck to look at the ocean. I'm very confident in what I saw. As I opened the door to the deck, I saw at a very high elevation in the sky and very what appeared to be high up and close to the beach, a red phosphorescent object. And that object started to go out towards the horizon. And as that object got closer to the horizon and I was following it, I could see the aircraft lights. And that aircraft was traveling from the west towards the east, almost perpendicular to the path that this object was taken. And I could see the lights going blink, blink, blink. And these objects converged. And when they converged... Not the fuel air explosion, because this was not a, a real dramatic source of ignition. Despite the fact that the experiment proves that the government's theory of a single spark destroying the plane is possible, 
Those that doubt the official explanation feel the nature of a fuel tank explosion doesn't match the damage of the recovered wreckage. There's also the lack of any new safety procedures. If they thought it was a mechanical, why hasn't the FAA done anything about it with other uh, 747s? They could have even changed the procedure and, and for example, and not allowed them to fly with low fuel. Or they could tell them to load only cold fuel on a hot day. It has taken more than 10 years, but new safety measures are finally being considered. Airlines may add inert, non-explosive gases to empty fuel tanks in an effort to protect airplanes from these kinds of disasters in the future. I think the inerting, the focus on the environment and not just the source of ignition, it's changed the way newer airplanes are going to be manufactured and certificated. It had an enormous impact. I would say 80% a function of TWA, maybe even more than that. Although this disaster has influenced airline safety, there continues to be doubt about the true cause of the crash. I think this accident's going to be very much like JFK.